Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. This is your psychedelic neuroscientist, Manesh Gurren here, back at you with another video. In case you're new to the channel, I'm your tour guide into the complex and fascinating world of psychedelic research. Today's topic, psychedelics and neuroplasticity. We're gonna dive into the science of how exactly psychedelics boost neuroplasticity and what that really even means. We wanna make sure that every trip counts and an understanding of neuroplasticity is essential for getting the most out of our psychedelic journey. It's also very important to understand for therapists and guides who are helping their clients with psychedelic integration. For this reason, I've actually also put together a free psychedelic neuroplasticity the overview and cheat sheet PDF to complement this video. Check out the link in the description below to grab that. Before I jump in, I briefly want to take you over to the sponsor of today's video, Sidel. Sidels are digital collectibles that let users create their own custom trips and also give access to a suite of utilities for people interested in psychedelics. Go check out their website, Sidel.com, to learn more. Thank you, Sidel, for sponsoring today's video. All right, let's start with a basic definition of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability for brain cells, also called neurons to create new connections with each other or to change existing ones. Essentially, it's your brain's ability to take shape as a result of learning new skills, gaining new knowledge, or having new experiences. And it's essential in creating or letting go of habits in our behavior and thinking, such as compulsively checking our phone every 15 minutes or doom scrolling through Instagram or TikTok. We're all guilty on that. In order to understand how psychedelics boost neuroplasticity and what the implications of that are, we need to get a bit more insight into some basic brain anatomy. We all know how complex the brain is, but did you know that current estimates have indicated that there are around 100 billion neurons, each of which are connected with up to 10,000 other neurons? That means your brain might have as many as a thousand trillion connections between neurons, which is pretty insane. In comparison, ChatGPT4 has a neural net on the order of around 1.7 trillion connections. So what does a neuron consist of and how does it form connections with other neurons? Well, a single neuron consists of three main parts, the cell body, also known as the soma, the axon, and the dendrite. So the axons are the senders of electrical impulses and the dendrites are the receivers. So when a neuron is activated, it sends an electrical impulse down its cell body to the end of its axon, and the end of the axon is also referred to as the axon terminal. These these axon terminals then form a connection with a dendrite on another neuron. And these connections between neurons, between the axon terminal and dendrite, is also called a synapse. And at a given synapse, the axon terminal of the sending neuron releases something called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters then affect the receiving neurons by activating certain receptors on its dendrite. So neurotransmitters are kind of like keys and the receptors are like locks. And if they fit together, that's what causes an effect. So if the receptors on a given receiving neuron's dendrites are activated, this changes the likelihood that that neuron will activate or not. An important thing to note here is that a given neuron's ability to form synapses with other neurons and receive neurotransmitters from them depends on how large and complex its dendrites are. You can imagine the dendrites as a neuron's airport. If an airport is large with a lot of runways, it'll have more space for airplanes to land. Similarly, a neuron with larger and more complex dendrites will have more space to make new synapses with other neurons. And with this greater number of possible connections, the neuron will be able to receive information from a greater variety of sources, and it will be involved in a larger number of possible patterns of activity. All right, I know this has already been a lot of information, but let's summarize what we've learned so far. First, we learned that neuroplasticity refers to the ability of neurons to form new synapses with each other or to change their existing ones. We also learned that a core component of this is the size and complexity of the dendrites on the receiving neurons, which refers to the amount of surface area at which the axons and axon terminals of other neurons can connect and share in neurotransmitters. Now, I know I said this was a summary, but I need to add one more thing here. It's important to mention that arranged along the dendrite are these little protrusions called dendritic spines. Dendritic spines are these little mushroom-like structures that connect with the axons of sending neurons to form synapses. So if dendrites are airports, then a given dendritic spine is a specific runway. So larger and more complex dendrites with more dendritic spines results in more synapses. And having more synapses between a given neuron and other neurons results in a greater number of activity patterns they can engage in. And this, in turn, can foster new behaviors or patterns of thinking. 
and overall lead to behavioral flexibility. Now that we have some understanding of how the brain and its neurons work, let's bring psychedelics into the mix. Psychedelic drugs including LSD, psilocybin, DMT slash ayahuasca, and 5-MeO-DMT, as well as a semi-psychedelic ketamine, have all been found to rapidly and potently increase the size and complexity of the dendrite and the number of dendritic spines. This is actually what we refer to when we say that psychedelics boost neuroplasticity. And this has been shown in multiple studies now and is a very reliable finding. But it's important to note that this has only been directly shown in studies done on mice or on cells in a dish. This is because you can analyze mouse brains or cells in a dish in ways you just can't do to human. Mainly because you can't just sacrifice a human, cut out their brain, and then stain it to look at cellular changes. Makes a lot of sense, right? There are, however, still ways to look at neuroplasticity in humans, but that's too much to get into in this video. So drop a comment if you're curious about that, and uh, maybe I'll cover it in a future one. Okay, now we know that psychedelics boost neuroplasticity through their effects on dendrite, but how exactly do they achieve this? Well, psychedelics target what's known as the serotonin 2A receptor via the lock and key activation mechanism that we highlighted earlier. And if you're interested in learning more about how exactly this receptor works and why it's important, check out my two previous videos on the topic. It's important to highlight that these psychedelic-induced changes in the dendrites aren't the same everywhere in the brain. They occur more or in the regions of the brain that have the greatest number of serotonin 2A receptors. One notable region of the brain with a lot of serotonin 2A receptors is the medial prefrontal cortex. Many of you have probably heard that the prefrontal cortex is important in many of our executive functions and things that make us human, such as our ability to pay attention, plan for the future, and problem solve. While well, this region of the brain also plays an important role in our ability to regulate our emotions and integrate our emotions with our thinking. And interestingly, multiple studies in rodents have found that increasing the complexity of dendrites in the medial prefrontal cortex specifically is associated with less depressive behavior. This makes sense because studies have also found that medial prefrontal cortex dendrites in rodents that undergo chronic stress and show depression-like behaviors are relatively atrophied. That is, their neurons in this part of the cortex have less complex dendrites and are essentially becoming more shriveled up. And this leads them to have less connections with other neurons. And in turn, this translates into impaired function in this part of the brain. This is thought to also happen in humans and to be related to depressed people's difficulty in regulating their emotions and escaping negative thought patterns. So the fact that psychedelics can boost dendrite complexity in the medial prefrontal cortex and restore normal functioning in its brain region has huge implications for their ability to reduce depression symptoms. More generally speaking, these boosts in neuroplasticity induced by psychedelics are thought to increase our ability to learn and develop new habits and behaviors while unlearning old ones. This is because core areas of our brain, such as the medial prefrontal cortex, as well as regions of the so-called default mode network that you might have heard of, become more plastic and are able to form new connections and reorganize existing ones. One recent study actually notably found that psychedelics unlocked neuroplasticity in adult rodents in a way that's usually only possible in early childhood. This study, published in Nature, described this as social critical period reopening, which is quite fascinating. If you want to learn more about that in a future video, I'll definitely cover that, so make sure to hit subscribe to stay tuned. An important thing to note here is that this boost in neuroplasticity via increased dendrite complexity is not necessarily an intrinsically good thing. Just like you can mold Play-Doh into something that's more or less beautiful, if you're not careful, this boosted neuroplasticity can lead you to create bad habits or deepen existing ones just as easily as it can lead you to break them. So in the end, neuroplasticity is a double-edged sword. It's not just the neuroplasticity that's important, it's what you do with it. This is why set, setting, and integration are so critical for psychedelic experiences. And on a bit of a more practical note, it's important to note that the research suggests that boosts in neuroplasticity after a psychedelic are most likely the strongest 6 to 72 hours after a trip, meaning that your brain is most plastic or most like Play-Doh during this period. This malleable period is where you'll have a stronger ability to step into new habits and begin to encode them in a lasting way. It's critical to be intentional and conscious of what behaviors you're engaging in at this time. These few days after a trip are the best to engage deeply with practices and techniques that support the person you want to be. This might be true for even longer as well because studies have indicated persisting increases in dendrite complexity even a month after a trip. Well, that was a lot of information, but I hope you've learned something valuable that you can take away for your next journey or to support your next client. Just drop a comment if you have any questions about what I've talked about and if there are any future related topics you want me to cover. And lastly, if you haven't already, for more non-BS, science-based videos about psychedelics, 
make sure to hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and ring the little notification bell so you don't miss any future uploads. Once again, this has been your personal psychedelic neuroscientist, Manesh Gurn. Until next time.